Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of three. Bronze Age Greek weapons, gear, and personal protective equipment. So let's just get into it, shall we, with shields. Now, the first kind of shield we're going to look at is iconic not just for the Bronze Age and not just for Bronze Age Greece, but uh, this is still a classic today. This is the tower shield. You still see fiberglass versions of this being used for crowd control. If you Google riot shield, you'll see a tower shield. Because this is a pretty effective way to cover up your body when you're in combat. Now, these tend to be large, heavy, and unwieldy. So they're at their best when you're using formation tactics, where Mobility isn't necessarily the first thing you're going for. What you need is a mobile wall from behind which you can uh, poke at your enemy with long sticks. And indeed, that's the use we see for these shields in Bronze Age Greek art. Sorry, my cat's shoving her face into my laptop, so pardon the shaky image here. Now, we're looking at two different primary source artifacts and one modern reconstruction here. So these are tower shields from frescoes in the island of Pylos. A fresco is a painting done on the plaster coating of a wall, and when we dig it up, this plaster has often fallen away from the wall in a sheet, so we find it in little fragments scattered over the floor of the building that we're excavating. And what you tend to see is a reconstructed best guess at what the original art would have looked like. Now, if you look at this picture carefully, you can see that there are little round pieces of plaster, and then there are gaps between them which have either been left blank or someone has gone in and painted in their best guess at the missing bits in modern paint. So for instance, I'm going to go in with my red marker here. So these fragments are bits of plaster that the archaeologist has been able to fit together by gluing them back like a puzzle with missing pieces. And then here, this arm, this end of the spear, this bit of the shield, they've all been filled in by a modern artist to match up with the bottom bit here, which is original plaster again. But you'll notice that the feet, those have been filled in, reconstructed from this soldier who's probably, but not really provably next to this soldier. So we're assuming that this guy has a bare foot, so everybody's got bare feet. We're also assuming that the rest of the shield looks like the top of the shield, or we're taking more complete bits like this in here that shows the entire shield and saying, you know, okay, so this shield in the front probably looks like this shield in the back. But a couple things we can say for sure. This speckled texture appears to be from raw hides where the fur has been left on from cattle or goats. This matches up with written evidence, specifically the Homeric epics. We'll get to that in lecture number three, so just kind of keep your feelers out for this. This is also part of the sage reading for this period. So we're using the epic tradition, which includes very lovingly described artifacts, and applying that to what we see in the art to make our best educated guesses as to what this art is representing. In this case, these splotchy surfaces on shields because they look like what we know cows and goats look like, and because poetry describing these kinds of artifacts says that, oh yeah, rawhide from an ox or a cow or a goat is used to cover the shield, it's pretty clear that what we're looking at is hide. Uh, but it might not be. You know, maybe somebody just decided to paint a nice hide veneer on the front of their canvas shield. So this is with a certain amount of caution, but our best educated guess based on this evidence does suggest that when we're looking at this blotchy kind of surface on a shield, it's probably a rawhide layer and the outermost layer at that. 
Now, the second piece of evidence we're looking at here is also from around 1600 BCE, here showing a seal stone. So this is a bronze bit of art that would have been on either a ring or an independent seal. You smush this into clay and that's your signature. And you use this on various kinds of documents and uh, locks on things too. In this particular seal stone, as many seal stones have coming out of Bronze Age Greece, there's a depiction of combat. And in this combat, the soldier on our far right here is carrying a tower shield that looks a lot like the tower shields we're seeing in this fresco painting. This specific kind of tower shield has a little bit of a saddle shape to it. There's a, a rise where the shield comes up to cover the face, but it's cut away at either side, likely so that the person using the tower shield can see around it without losing some protective coverage of the face. And that's important. Your face is a vulnerable area where uh, someone can strike a glancing blow that's still going to put you out of commission when you're fighting. Now, if you get poked in the face with a spear, you're going to have some trouble continuing on in your combat effectiveness. So this is an, an area of your body that people are aiming at. The tower shield is going to try to cover it, but you can't be an effective person in combat if you've got a tower shield in front of your face the entire time. You need to see where you're going and what you're poking at. So tower shields are frequently trying to compromise between facial coverage and area of sight. Modern shields get around this by using transparent materials like uh, transparent uh, plastics. You don't have those in the Bronze Age, so instead you have this uh, divot. Now, the inside of these shields, we've had to do a little bit more guessing on because art tends to show you the front of the shield. But we think that these shields were on a frame of round branches or sticks with a cross brace on the inside. So this image that I'm circling now, this is from um, Modern Artists Reconstruction. It's showing you the layers on the outside of the shield. This we infer from literary descriptions that survive of these shields, where they'll talk about you know, ridiculous layers of, um, of rawhide, like 12 layers of oxhide. That shield is going to be so heavy you're going to have trouble picking it up and operating it. 12 is probably an epic exaggeration, but three or four layers of rawhide would create a more sturdy front for your shield that would also bounce a little bit, and that's helpful in a shield. You do want a surface that's going to have some spring to it so that when, say, a rock hits your shield, it's going to bounce off the shield and back at the person who threw it. So you want a little bit of a trampoline kind of surface. But also, rawhide is more flexible than metal. Metal, when you dent it, you create a weak point that can then break and shear and then fail critically on you. Whereas rawhide, it's harder to break through rawhide. It's a much more springy, flexible surface. So it's going to create a more damage resistant protective surface. Now, because it is going to deform on you a little bit, it might not provide critical coverage against, say, a, a pointy object slamming on the shield. So you're going to sacrifice a little bit either way. Some depictions or descriptions rather of these shields have a, a metal layer sandwiched in between the rawhide layers. This artist has hypothesized with some evidence in support of it, a wicker surface at the very back. So this is branches or strips of tough bark that have been woven around sticks. And this has a a similar protective principle to rawhide. Wicker bends and flexes a little bit, but it is quite strong. Multiple braided strands creates a very tough surface that's also difficult to um, break through in a catastrophic way because when you get a point from an arrow or a spear through a wicker surface, you'll damage just that area, but it doesn't cause, like it does with metal, this 
break in a surface that can then shear and fail in a, a devastating way. So wicker is a really good choice for the inside surface of your shields. Not just your shields, we also know that this was a frequently used construction material. It's renewable. The materials are super easy to get a hold of in this landscape. All you need are thin green branches that you can weave. All of this makes an affordable and effective shield for your frontline infantry troops to use. And that's how we see it being used in the art here, is that you have a line of men who have a helmet covering their vulnerable head area, but the rest of them is covered mainly by the shield surface. In this case, you don't need a lot of complicated breastplates and fitted bits of armor because the shield is covering large parts of your body. Now their feet are gonna be vulnerable in this scenario to spears, to rocks. You can use the tower shield to shield your feet a little bit, but that is gonna be a place where you're attacking if you want to put troops out of commission. Okay, that's the principle of the tower shield. On to a variation on the tower shield. This is called the figure eight shield for obvious reasons, right? It looks like a figure eight. And I say it's a variation on the tower shield. That's because what they've done is taken a tower shield shape and then modified it a little bit to do some of the things that the tower shield was doing in the last slide better. So what has happened, and you can see this a bit in these two bits of jewelry here on the left side of the slide. So these are both little bronze brooches. These are small. These are jewelry made in the shape of a shield. They're super useful to us though, because they're in 3D, unlike this other piece of evidence we have here, another fresco painting. And if you start looking at what bits of the fresco are original and what bits are reconstruction, you can start to see the problem. So that's an original nugget. That's original. This end, original. But everything between those, that's been painted in. And the colors are a little fanciful here, too. You're not going to see a lot of hides that are blue unless you're covering them with say, woad or something. But we do have enough critical pieces that we can tell some things about these shields. For instance, there's this spinal shape down the middle of each shield that looks uh, a little hairy. There are these strokes coming out of it, and they're all going in one direction. The spine area of an ox hide is going to be a little bit darker, it's going to be a little bit hairier, and the hide there is thicker because it's right over the spine. So that's going to create a point of strength that's going to project out a little bit when you're covering a shield with a hide. And we think that's what's going on as they've put the spine onto the center of the shield where you need extra protection. But what, what might also be going on here is that there's been a metal overlay either inside the shield or on the outer surface to kind of reinforce this front leading edge for reasons that are going to become a little bit more obvious as we unpick this design some more. So an oval shield then has been dented in on this side and this side. Let me do this back in red. This side and this side. You can see it a lot more clearly here and here on this brooch. And this pinching in creates a bit of a wasp waist that gives the shield its number eight shape. Uh, my stands, by the way, we're not using our modern number eight, so they're not thinking, ah, figure eight. That's medieval Arabic numerals, so uh, yeah, we're not using those in the ancient world. It's a modern term. We're, I don't think we have an ancient term for this shield type. Uh, actually, we do. Dipolon, sometimes they'll call this. We'll call it figure eight, though, just for sanity's sake. Okay. So this pinching in creates a line of sight where you can look around the shield and see where you are on the battlefield. So that's one function of this. But another function is that by creating these curved shapes, you're reinforcing the overall structural integrity of the shield where you need it most. That is 
the center spine, the leading edge. And this is because shields are not just defensive objects. They're also offensive. You use your shield to smash into the other person. You can use the edge to smash downwards onto feet. The top edge you can smash upwards into chins. Shields are part of your offensive and defensive weaponry, and you use them with your offensive weapon too. So a smash with your shield followed up by a poke from the spear or a stab from your sword is going to be a one-two punch that helps you take out somebody in opposing shield walls. The angle that you smash your shield into somebody else's shield can cause their shield to fail or to tilt or to tip. And to be really effective, you need to have a shield that isn't going to crumple in on your forearm and break your, your bones. Your forearm bones, your radius, and your ulna are delicate bones that do break pretty easily. And once those break, your shield arm is done. It's going to be intensely painful. If you've ever broken your forearm, you know what I mean here. And not even a full break will cause this sort of debilitating injury. Like even a green stick hairline fracture on that area is going to make it very difficult for you to operate your shield effectively because your radius and ulna won't rotate properly. And if you can't rotate that arm, you can't rotate your shield and you can't use it as effectively. Okay. So that leading edge, putting more distance between your forearm and the shield surface creates a crumple zone where an opposing blow isn't going to break your arm. It's creating a, a hard point surface so that when you smash somebody with your shield, you're concentrating the force into a smaller area and a smaller area of force creates a more effective impact. You're making a shield that's not going to deform and warp on you while you're using it as much because the curves reinforce each other. They redistribute force in a more effective way. And you're sacrificing surface area from the sides of the shield where you don't necessarily need as much protection. You need the area below your waist covered because there are a lot of vulnerable areas there. Your center gut is still going to be covered by this shape, but then you also need your shoulders covered because that's the bit of your body that's operating both spear and shield and sword. And then you need a little curve so that you can duck down and cover your face. This is about the size of a tower shield, so this is still covering most of your body's vulnerable areas. This on its own is a really nice compromise between coverage offensive capability and defensive capability. It's not covering quite as much of your body as is a tower shield, but it's still doing pretty well, especially when you use it like we're gonna see on this next slide. Um, this is another artist's reconstruction, by the way, showing what one of these might have looked like. Uh, this artist has shown us a very fancy figure eight shield with uh, bronze reinforcement on the central spine so you can really see how this operates and the inside of it looks a lot like the tower shield we we're just looking at yeah there's an x frame that is keeping the tension on the shield surface and also creating a grip for the person using it okay so this is from a bronze dagger found at the tombs at mycenae and this is gold and silver plating that's been pressed into a bronze surface. So you can see the, the bronze here, the, the sword surface has uh, worn away a little bit at either edge. You can see the lines from where the metal was worked over and over and folded. It's, it's very pretty, this thing. But what we're looking at now is a line of warriors who are combining figure eight and tower shields in an alternating fashion to create a more effective shield wall. So you have a tower shield, a figure eight, a tower shield, a figure eight. Here the artist is helpfully showing us a rare view from the inside of the shields. So you can see the warrior's full bodies. What's interesting is that these shields are not being used with the forearm or the hand, but rather with a shoulder strap, you can see it here, on both the tower shield and the figure eight, holding the shield 
over the person's body while they're using both hands to operate their spears and their weapons. In some other art, there does seem to be a hand on the inside of this, the shield. Your artist reconstruction have given you both a shoulder strap and a hand grip on the inside of these shields. That's likely what was going on in reality, too, is you could hold it for greater control, but if you just needed to cover your body, you could sling it over your shoulder. In this case, they're, they're fighting a lion, so the, the lion is not going to have as many ways to knock your shield off of your potty, so here it makes sense. Ouch, kitty. No, I, I didn't mean to say the lion wasn't combat effective. Shh, 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 shh. Sorry, my uh, TA objects to the way I phrased that. Oh, shush. Right. Part of what seems to be working out pretty well for um, three out of, or, no, sorry, four out of five of these warriors is that by putting their tower shields and figure eights in staggered formation, they can use the dip in the side of the figure eight shield as an opening for attack. There's also a space for an archer. So you see the archer is very far back in the formation, but they're able to shoot through the gap in the shields and that's kind of how this arrow is aimed it's going through the gaps in the shield while not over and down into the the lion who's doing quite well here side note european lions are a thing and they were roaming around the greek countryside into the seven eight hundreds bce so this is a very plausible hunting scene. What else did I want to say about this? Ah, yeah, so this isn't working out for one guy, at least. Um, this fellow in the front has fallen down, his, is not taking his shield with him for whatever reason. Uh, so you can see that this is a pitched contest, very exciting, but the, the lion I don't think is gonna come out of this well. Uh, this is all inlaid onto the blade of a large um, short sword or dagger. So it's in this medium range between um, a very short distance stabby weapon with a little bit of sword reach, but it's not quite long enough to be a sword that you could use uh, if you're not in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it's neat. All right. So our final shield type is a questionable one. I'm talking here about a round shield. Now, the reason why historians get very interested in when the round shield first gets used in Greece is because round shields are going to become the iconic shield of the hoplite phalanx, this style of massed combat that's dominant in the Greek mainland from uh, the archaic period right on into the Hellenistic period. And indeed, round shields are still being used in various contexts right on up into the Middle Ages. Round shields are a classic and something that becomes very much a part of warfare as it's practiced in a Greek cultural context and then later disseminated to the Mediterranean. So we're very interested in at what point and how round shields start getting used in ancient Greece. Those who go for an earlier date will point to this bit of artwork as evidence that round shields that are strapped to a forearm are being used in an early period in Greek warfare. But if you look a little bit closer at this, there are some problems with that. First, let's outline the part of this art that is not reconstruction. Okay, so here in red, and you can see the, the little edge of the original plaster flake, that is what we're using to reconstruct a shield. Uh, normally, what I do is have you, as a class, look at this and talk to me a bit about what's problematic. So we're online now, so pause, look at this. Okay, let's talk about 
why this is a bit of a sketchy reconstruction. Uh, first, the surface of the arm that the shield is attached to is the wrong surface. If you look, there is this fellow's back. We have strapped the shield onto like this part of the forearm, which is a really stupid way to attach your shield. Like, how do you cover your body with that? Like, the only way that's going to work is if you're like roundhouse punching somebody in the face with your shield. This is not how shields work. Uh, this is really stupid. Also, let me take the eraser so you can see this a little bit better. That strap is edited in. That's part of the reconstruction. So that that strap. Mm, sketchy, no. Also, the round other edge of this shield is all reconstructed. This could be a figure eight shield. And it would kind of make sense as a figure eight shield. Then there might be a strap going around the side. Uh, the hand position would make a lot more sense. Maybe the elbow is coming down this way and then up and he's bracing it across his body a little bit. However you look at it, this is a pretty awkwardly held shield, but it makes a lot more sense for him to be gripping it from this angle than it is to have it strapped on his arm. That's just a, a nonsense way to operate a shield here. So for these reasons, this is not proof that round shields were in use as early as 1300 BCE on the Greek mainland. Uh, this is just going to have to be a nope. And indeed, this is the only bit of art that we could possibly make into a round shield this early. It's just no. Now, when do we start seeing round shields? Interesting question. Glad you asked. Next slide. We see them in the late Mycenaean period and only in pictorial evidence. So here we're looking at a bit of pottery that dates from the very tail end. So we're in the 1100s to uh, 1000s -ish BCE, so very tail end of the Mycenaean period where they're no longer a Mycenaean expansion, but sort of a Mycenaean contracture. This is also the period where we start seeing round shields, not among Mycenaeans, but among sea peoples. If you recall from last week, we saw round shields on the sea peoples with the little horn helmets. And some of the Phoenicians or Philistines or whoever those guys were seem to have round shields too. So we think that the round shields might have been introduced as part of a sea people thing. And then they start getting picked up by the people who are being uh, raided by the sea peoples, which makes some sense. Here are some shields from Cyprus. Cyprus is an island right off the coast of modern day Turkey, ancient Anatolia. So this is closer to the Near East and the Levant than it is to mainland Greece. And it's exactly where we'd expect to see round shields because the islands are where we think sea peoples were hanging out in this period. There's also another shield, this time from Athens. So now we're on the Greek mainland. Finally, we're on the Greek mainland. So these are from Cyprus. Now this is a small round bronze shield with this long spike in the middle of it that we find in Athens. So 1, 000, uh, 10, 000 rather is a little after the period at which Mycenaean influence in Linear B is waning. So we're in the twilight years of the Greek Bronze Age, and we're starting to get into the so-called Dark Age, which is what's coming next. The scare quotes are important. <clears throat> this, however, is one that should give us pause, because th th as a shield that you would strap onto your arm or hold, this would be super impractical. It's largish, and bronze is heavy, and this long spike in the middle is going to make your shield center heavy. So, like, the amount of tactical advantage you'd gain from smashing somebody in the face with this built in spear projection is thoroughly mitigated by the amount of upper body strength you'd need to be able to wield this in a remotely combat effective manner. So what may be going on, and this is going to be a constant challenge to us as we look at artifacts from the ancient Mediterranean, is that this 
might be a bit of armoring perhaps for the side of the ship. We do see depictions of ships from this period that have round shields secured to part of the um, upper railings as part of the ship's armor. So possibly it's not personal protective equipment, it's uh, something meant to be attached to fortifications. The other thing this might be is fantasy armor. During this period, in the Bronze Age, and indeed for many years to come, one of the things you offer to the gods is weapons. Sometimes weapons that you've captured for your, from your enemies on the battlefield, but often weapons that are made specifically as gifts for the gods, where the point is not for them to be useful in combat, but for them to look really awesome in front of your friends when you go to give them to the temple. That might be the context we're dealing with here. Another context in which awesome trumps useful is decorations for palace facilities. When you have a place where an elite person is hanging out, seeing their minions, you want to have nifty looking badass stuff on your walls, your guards. You want it to look intimidating. You don't need it to be actually useful, you just need to, it to be impressive because you're in a context where you're not currently using force in an obvious way against your opponents, but you want to show that you have a monopoly on violent power and the financial wherewithal to afford fancy toys. This creates a market for fantasy weapons, swords that are like stupidly big, like way too big to be useful on a battlefield, even for a modern sized person, let alone ancient people who were much shorter on average than the average, say, Baltimore college student. Giant impractical swords impress people. And this is still something that influences the art of warfare today. For instance, think about the last time you saw a sword in, say, a video game. How big was that sword? How practical would that sword have been to wield? Are the people in the video game, like, built well enough to be able to even pick that thing up? This isn't just a modern art thing. Ancient art, too, relied on things that look cool. And that's something that we're going to have to ask of ourselves as we look at artifacts in this lecture and beyond is, was this made to look cool or was this made to be useful? It can be both, but often the two goals oppose each other. Okay. Now, chariots do show up in Mycenaean art. Uh, we just saw one a minute ago with those folks with uh, Pylos round shields earlier too. This is from 1500 BC, so we're reaching back a little bit here. But the context we see them in don't look like the kinds of contexts we saw last week at the Battle of Kadesh. We don't see large units of chariots riding out against other large units of chariots. For the most part, it seems to be elite people driving their chariots around with other elite people for sport, for hunting, but not exclusively. We do have images like this one, which I've chosen specifically because this does look like a warfare context where we are riding down an opposing person who also appears to be naked. Again, we have this naked person getting run over by a wheeled vehicle trope. I bring it up because keep in mind, people in Bronze Age Greece were in frequent contact with people elsewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean who also had these scenes of naked people getting run over by chariots. So they're imitating the art of their neighbors a little bit in a style that feels authentic to them. So some of what's going on here definitely is trying to uh, keep up with the Babylonian Joneses, as it were. They're looking at the ancient Near East and like, ah, yes, we have chariots on our walls too. But also they do seem to have gotten access to chariots, at least uh, chariots for recreational purposes and general badassery. But again, we don't see evidence for massed chariot battles in the same way that we saw them in the Levant, the Near East, the Fertile Crescent, and in Egypt. And this has to do with Bronze Age Greece's separation 
by land from Asia. In order to get overland from Asia into Greece, you need to go like up around the Black Sea, over a mountain range, and then all the way back down through the riverlands and the Danube River Delta into <laughs> Greece. And then you have to go through all these rocky mountainous areas in, into Greece proper. Now, this worked well enough for Proto-Indo-European speakers, probably through a trade process, but it's not a kind of route that makes sense as an invasion route for chariots. If you try to invade Greece by chariot, you're going to be very disappointed with your choices. So likely this is chariot adoption for coolness reasons rather than combat effectiveness. Uh, Greek topography just doesn't really lend itself to chariot combat effectiveness. And we see that reflected a little bit in how chariots look in the Homeric epics. When chariots show up in Homer, as they do all over the place, it's usually a noble person's charioteer drives them into the battlefield, they jump off, they fight, 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 and then their charioteer picks them up and takes them back home. It's a bit like a battle taxi and a little bit less like an arrow shooting assault vehicle. That might be what's going on with the limited chariot use amongst elite peoples in Bronze Age Greece. But again, I'm being very cautious about this because the evidence is super shaky here. Okay. So let's talk about armor. We've got our shields, a little bit about chariots. There are several armor finds from the Mycenaean world. And there are also descriptions of armor that matches these finds in the Homeric epics. So those are our two main streams of information for this. We have actual finds, we have snippets like you'll find in the Sage chapter for this week. The iconic one, and the one that we'll be looking at moving ahead, is the Boar's Tusk Helmet. Now, before I get into this in the face-to-face -face class, I usually pause again and ask you guys to think, okay, What's the point of using boar's tusks on helmets? Like, what does it communicate when you see somebody coming at you with a hat made out of wild pig teeth? So pause here and think about that for a minute. Okay, stop pausing. Let's unpack this. So if you've ever met a boar, they are very aggressive. Yes, and also very dangerous because of their tusks. They have these large jutting tusks coming out of their jaws, and they will run at you and try to stick that tusk into the closest available bit of your anatomy, which is usually your groin area or your upper thigh. For those of you who don't know, there's a major, 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 major artery running through that area, the femoral artery. This goes down the inner surface of your leg from your groin to about your knee. And if that artery is nicked, you can bleed out very fast. I'm talking like two to four minutes, which is one of the many reasons why you shouldn't keep a gun in your belt in the front of your pants, because it puts it in striking distance of your femoral artery. And if that gun goes off, um, if you happen to have genitals in the way, like say goodbye to them, but also then it might nick your femoral artery and you can die. It's actually a plot point in Band of Brothers. So I'm just PSA, don't put guns in your pants, especially not the front of your pants, because there are so many ways you can come to regret that decision. <clears throat> but why I'm telling you this now is that this is where the boar's tusk is trying to stick you. Yeah. And if you are lucky enough to not get a boar's tusk in your femoral artery, you're still in a lot of trouble because boars don't just use their tusks for impaling people. When they're not impaling you, they're rooting around in the soil trying to get food and mushrooms and stuff out of the loam in pastures and uh, wildernesses and so on. Soil is a major reservoir source of a lot of bacteria and other uh, pathogenic things, including anthrax, which you really don't want shoved deep into your tissues, which is what's going to happen if a boar's tusk gets shoved into your meaty tissues. 
that point is going to put dirty, dirty nastiness deep into your body in a way that's difficult to clean. Puncture wounds are really hard to clean because they're narrow, your flesh will close in on it, and it'll create pockets for that bacteria to fester to create an abscess, and then this can get into your bloodstream, giving you septicemia and a horrible, horrible death several weeks after your boar hunting incident. So if you go out to hunt a boar, you have to have a certain disregard for probable nasty death. It's actually a plot point in the Odyssey that boar hunting can cause massive injuries that cause you know, traumatic scarring at best and death at worst. Yeah. So going out and killing enough boars to cover your head and face with them means that you have not just on one occasion, but on several occasions gone out into the woods and solicited a uh, hostile encounter with an animal who is trying to drive a septicemic stake into your jiggly bits. That is somebody that you may not want to mess with on the battlefield. That's impressive. It's kind of like covering your skull in, I don't know, um, dinosaur teeth. Or, oh, what else would I not want to fight? Like Predator from the movie Predator, like Predator exoskeletons, that would be bad. Um, what else would I not like to be covered in Borg electronics? At any rate, you, you get the point. You're coating your head, a very visible part of you, in the evidence of your badassery. So as a psychological weapon, the boar's tusk helmet is fantastic. On a practical level, though, boar's tusks are made out of dentin. Teeth are hard. They're resilient. They're a very difficult part of your body to break. That's part of the point, really. And for boars, that's especially true because they're using them as weapons, but also to eat really tough, hard to eat food. That means that you're putting a very tough surface over the surface of your skull so that blows that hit it are not going to go through easily. And even when a, a tusk shatters, it's going to do so in a way that doesn't create a lot of splint, I mean, some splintering yet, but not a lot. It's also not just one continuous layer of metal that can fail catastrophically, but again, it's little modular bits that you can swap in and out and replace and repair. But also, if you manage to break one plate, it's just one plate. It's not going to be as catastrophic as, say, a continuous bronze surface. So all of this creates a practical covering for your head. Now, at a certain point, uh, and here I'm talking like the 1800s, we saw descriptions of these in Homer and we were like, oh, no, no, nobody's making a helmet like this. This is clearly just a poet's invention. But then we started excavating Bronze Age Greek sites and we started finding these things. This here is just one example. It's from the National Museum in Athens. We also started finding art of people wearing them like that. And we found them all over the area that Mycenaeans were active in. So Bronze Age Greek people did indeed wear these. We find them in their graves. This is a thing. But we are missing important parts of them because while the tusk survives, the leather bits that hold the helmet together have not. So what I've got on the next few slides is somebody's reconstruction of what Bronze Age armor and a helmet would look like. So this is going to be my segue into chest armor. So there's our helmet. You'll see there are holes at the top and the bottom of each tusk that you can lace together. So our reconstruction has used a strip of leather and gut to sew these into graduated layers. And then they've put this over a leather interior that's made out of a single cylindrical piece of leather that's been cut into strips and then bound together at the top to create this kind of onion head shape thing, which makes sense. That creates a nice springy padding for your helmet. Padding is important. If you just put metal or teeth or whatever right up against your skull and somebody hits you, it's not going to anticipate force very well. You're going to really regret your life decisions. 
So here we are looking at the helmet under construction. They've put in some bronze che cheek pieces too. We see evidence for this in art that makes a certain amount of sense. Eventually they cut down the leather a bit, but this creates a kind of open divot here in the top, which then has a long horsehair tail affixed to it up at the top so you get a nice crest. Feathers might have also been used for this too. We see depictions of crests and tops and finials and things on these helmets in art. So we're pretty firm on that. Some kind of a plume. And then this breastplate has been reconstructed from evidence like the warrior face, which is coming up on a slide. There are other kinds of chest armor too coming out of this period that we're going to look at next, but this is just one attempt where they've taken leather armor and they're using discreetly placed bronze plates to kind of reinforce that armor. Sensible, but here we're on shakier ground a bit. And then here it all is put together with the tunic with little fringes on it. Um, another thing you'll notice him wearing are these items. These are called greaves, G-R-E-A-V-E-S. You'll see them mentioned in your reading. This is an important part of Bronze Age armor because Bronze Age shields don't cover your shin very well and you wanna protect your shin. It's vulnerable. The bone is very close to the surface, so wounds on the shin can quickly become bone infections that can be very painful and uh, very smelly and eventually very deathy. So you, you, know, you wanna keep your shin covered and protected. You still do. This is why if you play soccer or football or something, you keep armor on your shin bone. It's a very vulnerable area and it's a prime one for folks to attack. So here we're looking at a close-up from that warrior vase I was mentioning earlier, showing my Mycenaean warriors. Here we're looking at our reconstruction and you can kind of see where he got his ideas. Uh, something that's interesting going on in this vase is that we do see what looks like round shields, but they're not quite round shields because there's this curved, bite taken out of them like uh, they've been attacked by cookie monster or something so this is a crescent shield shape and this is good for your upper body but there's this cut out of it so that you can use your spear without having the shield surface get in the way so that's just another shield option that i'm not gonna unpack too heavily here up the top you can see the horsehair plume probably horsehair and then these folks have boar tusks also coming out of the front of their helmet. So this is another context in which horns on your helmet are acceptable, but horns coming out of the front of your helmet, not off the sides of your helmet. Apparently they're not feeling as brave as the sea people were last unit. Now I mentioned that we do have some actual piece of chest armor coming out of this culture. And here is the chest armor I'm referring to. This is the Dendra Panoply. It dates to about 1400 BCE or so. And this is our best preserved full set of Bronze Age Greek armor. Now we have other bits of armor that look a lot like this that have survived in more partial forms where a lot of the pieces have been lost or just fewer bits of it. But this does seem to be an armor type that's found in people that are part of this linear B writing Greek speaking cultural group. And this is another armor that we have some questions about. Uh, so before I go into those questions, here's another pause point. So pause for a minute and I want to ask you, who would wear this into battle? How practical is this and for whom? So pause. And okay, we're back, so let's talk about this. Our reenactor, who has lovingly made a wearable version of this, has a long pike, so a two-handed spear that he's holding and getting ready to like stand and use. But you can also see some of the problems here, because this armor 
doesn't have anything to secure it to the waist. It's free hanging from your shoulders in the front and the back. And these are full thick sheets of bronze. Imagine the pressure that's on the fine bones of your collar bone, your shoulder blade, and your shoulder socket coming off of sheets of bronze hanging all the way down to your knees. Painful, yeah? That's gonna hurt. And this is something that if you've not worn armor, it might not occur to you, but this is a problem. If your armor isn't secured closely around your waist and all of the weight is hanging off your shoulders, it begins to hurt. The pressure on your skin can eventually cause the skin to break down and develop sores. And even with padding, it's gonna start hurting you after a while. Uh, I once for Halloween wore chain mail to teach in and by the end of the day, I was in agony because my knees were killing me and my shoulders hurt like a... And this was chain mail that I'd carefully belted and I was wearing padding. So I'm saying all of this because this armor is hanging right off of the person's shoulders. Ow! Yeah, little ow. Um, and not just that, but look at these shoulder covers, these pulled runes. Now, these at first glance may look kind of practical, right? They're hinged a bit, so they, there's some movement, and it looks like they're split so you can raise and lower your arms a bit. But if you think about it a little bit more, you can't raise your arms too well in this. There isn't a lot of upward mobility here. This has your shoulders clamped down pretty tight in a single position. Now. Our pikeman is able to hold his pike, but there's a limited amount of flexibility in that. And this already, when your armor, there aren't holes on the sides to attach the front and the back of the armor to you. So this armor is flapping freely from your front and from your back. When you start moving around, it's gonna like clank, 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 which is gonna put further pressure on you. It's gonna throw off your center of gravity. This is super impractical armor if you're doing any kind of footwork. Okay, so for pikemen, we're probably looking at a no. I mean, maybe, but probably no. It's not that practical for this. Um, one last thing, by the way, look at the neck protection here. Now, this is soldered onto the breastplate, so this isn't a separate piece. This is like a turtleneck that's permanently affixed that like your head's just kind of coming out of. You can see that our reenactor, the line on this neck piece is something like you can turtle his head down and look out of it. Um, actually looks very much like a 40k space marine. If you're wearing this and you try to look at your feet, you're not going to be able to see your feet which is not good. You can't tilt your head very well in this, also not good. I mean, it might be nice because if somebody like whacks you on your helmet and the plume gets caught, you've got a little bit of stabilization for your neck, so that's nice. But it's not a really flexible kind of neck protection. Now, it's gonna keep you from getting your head cut off. Really good, full points on that. But again, we have something that in hand-to-hand -hand combat, is gonna make you like a, an upright turtle with a couple of beers in a system. It's just not great for that. So what do we think is going on with the Denver Panoply? Well, one suggestion and one that I think is a pretty shrewd one is that this is charioteer armor. So this is for the person driving the chariot. And if we go down the list of things this armor will do well, it starts making a little bit more sense. A chariot driver isn't gonna to have to raise their arms. Their arms are going to be clamped down next to their body so that they can you know, pull on the reins. You pull like this. And you're gonna keep your arms tucked to be able to do that. So great, that's gonna work real well for you. A charioteer isn't moving around a lot. You're standing in the box of your chariot and you want to be kind of planted really firmly there. So this kind of heavy armor with a skirt on it below your center of gravity is gonna keep you 
plonked down in your chariot driving position real well. If you need to kneel down, you can. And sometimes chariot drivers would have to kneel, and that's cool. And it's also designed in such a way that if a blow is coming at you from the ground, so upwards, the plates are lapped over each other bottom over top, which is what you'd want to see if most of the blows are coming at you from below. This is typical, by the way, of cavalry armor too. If you ever want to guess whether armor is made for somebody on horse or elephant back, look at the directions that the scales are overlapped. If it's bottom to top, you're probably dealing with cavalry armor. So if you're standing on a chariot, this is a sensible way to overlap your plates. Now also, we know that charioteers were sometimes taken out by blows to the head from uh, rocks in a sling or rocks just thrown from the ground, from arrow blows. You wanted a ranged weapon that would knock the driver out so the chariot then goes off kilter and then the person in the back can't shoot at you. So if you're worried about being hit in the head with a rock, this isn't a bad idea. Your neck is stabilized, so that blow isn't going to snap your neck. Your helmet covers up your ears and your jaw really well, so you're not vulnerable to jaw injuries, which is something else that would be super incapacitating. And then finally, blows from below are going to glance off of that and ricochet away from your face. If you're driving a chariot, this isn't the worst armor you could pick. So if we are to argue that this would have been armor used in combat, and we have to be careful about this because there isn't proof on this particular bit of armor. Like there aren't marks from somebody who's tried to shoot an arrow at it or like, you know, divots that we get in armor that's been used in battles. So we can't be like, oh yeah, somebody has totally tried to stick a sword into this dude. This may very well be ceremonial armor that's made to look super duper impressive, but not be that practical. Again, <laughs> If this is somebody's bodyguard, this is going to have great optics, but it's got a lot of practicality problems with it. So I think our best case scenario, if this is combat armor, probably for a chariot driver. If it's not, then some kind of a ceremonial guard. And there is some evidence in Bronze Age Greek art where we see people wearing outfits of armor like this in parade contexts that show us that, you know, at least part of the time, this would have been used for optics, for looking good when you're in a military procession. Okay, so how did Bronze Age Greeks interface with the wider community? This I'm going to address real super briefly, but again, if you're interested in this, if the Greek Bronze Age totally rings your bell, look up my colleague Dr. Lane, this is his specialty and he has so many more cool things to say about this. But here we're going to look at some art from outside of mainland Greece to see uh, some possible evidence of Mycenaeans, people from this Bronze Age Greek culture, working abroad and interfacing with the community beyond Greece. So at the top, we have a bit of Hittite ceramic art. So this is a Hittite depiction. Hittites again are in central Anatolia showing what might be a, an Achaean mercenary. So as I mentioned in Unit 2 and Unit 1, I think, as well, we see mentions of people called Akaiowa in Hittite records, and that's very similar to the Greek word Achaean, which is one of the earliest words used by Greeks about themselves. So there is literary evidence that suggests that people from the Bronze Age Greek mainland were going overseas to serve in mercenary groups for the Hittites and people in the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley in Mesopotamia, um, maybe as far south as Egypt too. So much like everybody else in this region, they're part of an international community. And this particular warrior is wearing what looks like the armor we saw in the warrior vase and we've seen in archaeology too. So there's this helmet with this crosshatch pattern that looks a heck of a lot like a boar's tooth helmet. There's a plume coming off the top, 
It's even got that one horn coming out of the middle of the forehead, so you look like extra boar-ish. And this is in 1350 BCE, so the height of the Mycenaean expansion. So this is about when we expect to see Bronze Age Greeks showing up, and there they are, showing up. This is a chariot scene from a pot in Cyprus. Cyprus, if you recall, is this island in the Aegean that's right off the coast of um, the modern day Levant and Anatolia. It's like right in the armpit of Anatolia. And here you've got a four-spoke chariot wheel, two people riding the chariot, you've got a driver, maybe a warrior, but they don't seem to be doing the warfare right now. This looks a little bit more like a procession. Behind him is somebody carrying two pots of ointment, which suggests, again, probably this is a procession scene and not a direct warfare scene. But the people on this pot do seem to be using the same chariot types, even covered with this rawhide cover that we see in Bronze Age Greek art. So maybe this is another instance of Achaean mercenaries, or maybe not. This also might be Achaeans who have moved to Cyprus. There are Linear B tablets across the Aegean during this High Bronze Age period, so you know, maybe that's what's going on, maybe not. And then here is that warrior face I've been teasing the entire time. So here we are back to it. So this is from 1200 BCE. Now, now we're getting into the tail end of the Bronze Age. 1274 is the Battle of Kadesh. 1200-ish BCE is in this period where the sea people are at their height. These large Bronze Age empires are beginning to experience loss of territory and withdrawal from the coasts. This system of international trade is breaking down. People living in these large centralized uh, hilltop fortifications are no longer able to get fancy trade goods from abroad and convince people to pay them taxes as a result. So it, here we're at the beginning of the end. But we're looking at this now because it's our best evidence for what Mycenaean panel plea, that is what Mycenaean armor looked like, specifically for foot soldiers. Because again, the Denver panel plea, that might be from a charioteer and it's not super practical for infantry. So here's what we think infantry would have looked like. They're wearing tunics. We don't see anything that suggests a fitted breastplate, and that makes sense. Their shield's covering that part of their body. They're this short tunic. Things that look like knee socks are probably greaves that are attached to a leg wrapping. They've got these nice fringed tunics. This is suggestive of wool or linen fabric, probably wool, knowing what we know about this region. What's also interesting are these little bag things on the the spear objects they're carrying now this might be some kind of a provision satchel but what it might also be is a throwing loop we'll talk about this more when we talk about javelins in the archaic period but this is a way to throw throwing spears or javelins longer by attaching a spiral thong to them and then releasing so that's a preview of something we'll talk about in the next lecture then again, it could just be their lunch. We're not entirely sure what's up with that. All right, so let's continue to talk about pointy objects that you stick into other people in order to win glory, fame, and victory. We've already talked about throwing spears, that's a javelin, and thrusting spears. We'll be calling those just spears. Those are pretty typical. We see them all across the Eastern Mediterranean during the Bronze Age. and if you think about it, that makes sense. Spear tips are more cost effective. If you can afford enough metal for a whole sword, that means you're a super fancy kind of person. And the Bronze Age Aegean is no exception. Now, the earliest type swords here dating to about 1700, 1600 BCE, so this very early period, right when we're seeing the emergence of these hilltop fortifications in this complex society, speaking uh, Greek and using Linear B, so this very early years of this culture's bursting onto the scene in Greece. 
they're using these very long swords. We find them in grave sites, and that's the primary context for these. These swords are ridiculously long. I'm talking like taller than I am long. So um, Dr. Jones Lewis is five foot three of human. These swords are about that long. That's a very impractical length for a sword, especially a bronze sword, but also swords that are this thin. I've seen these in museums and they are skinny. These are swords that if you smacked somebody in the face with them, they'd probably like bend awkwardly sideways. sideways. And sometimes they're deliberately bent like that as part of their, um, the ritual that was used when they were first deposited in the sites we dig them up from. Often these are graves, but not 100% of the time. So what do we think is going on here? Well, the grave thing might be part of the clue. You don't, it's going to be really expensive to bury a whole functional sword in a grave. That's a lot of metal and dead people, generally speaking, aren't great at using swords unless there were Mycenaean zombies I'm unaware of at least. So when you bury somebody with a sword, you don't need it to be a really functional sword. You need it to look really good at the funeral. And that seems to be what these swords are for. But it's not just at funerals. Keep in mind, these are also being displayed as part of your meeting the public events and part of your leadership activities. So you might have it on display in the room when people bring you their excess harvest, their tribute, their taxes. You might wear it when you go around to inspect your lands. So this is a part of the, the psychology of projecting power, is if you are awesome enough to have a giant sword, you are saying, I am wealthy and I'm badass and my sword is bigger than yours, so watch out. So we think that's what's going on with these swords. These don't seem to have been very useful combat swords. But as we go forward a bit, if you look at the middle of this timeline, so here we're in the 1400s-ish, going into the 1200s-ish, um, 1200s-ish especially. Uh, keep in mind that's when sea peoples are making an uptick and things are getting a little desperate on the coasts. This is the period also where Mycenaeans seem to be at their largest expansion. There may have been more foreign warfare activity than just mercenary stuff. Here we get more practically designed swords. And this particular one, this uh, D1 type, is still pretty skinny. We're still seeing these vanity swords being buried with people, but there are also swords that have a tang shaped like this. So the tang is the bit of the sword that extends from the blade and goes into the grip. And the longer the tang, the more sturdily the sword is attached to the grip. And you want that in a sword. The other thing that's going on with a long tang is that it gives us an idea of what the hilt is shaped like if the hilt doesn't survive. Now, sometimes we do get a pretty nicely surviving hilt due in part to a burial practice in which gold leaf was put over the ends of swords. So I've given you some pictures of that here at the bottom. This we think was done shortly before burial because this is a really impractical way to fit out a sword in life. A sword that you're using to fight is going to get blood all over the grip. Blood is slippery and tacky, so you need a lot of texture on the grip so you can keep holding onto the sword and use it even while it's covered in the blood of your enemies. Gold leaf does not do that. So gold leaf also is not very sturdy. It tends to flake off and you don't want the surface of your sword sloughing off while you're stabbing people with it. So all of this leads us to assume, and I think quite securely, that this gold leaf was a final step in just making things look pretty for the funeral. But this hilt type is a pretty legit way to do the hilt. Often there'll be so the pommel is the back end that's coming off the opposite side of your hand from the sword blade. Sometimes these will be weighted a little bit so that with a counterweight you can more carefully control a sword. Sometimes though the pommel will be very small and truncated like this one. That gives you a little bit wider of a swing range 
so it just depends on what kind of a radius you want for your slashing switchy blows. Shorter swords are made for stabbing. You can do some chopping with them, but for the most part, these are good stab shapes. One other thing about these sword designs, even on the ones that are clearly show swords, uh, not working swords, you'll see this spine down the center. That's a feature, not a bug. This is in part to make it easier to get a sword out of someone you've stabbed. You need this because when you stab a sword into somebody's body, the person's body closes around the sword and creates a vacuum. Pulling it out is difficult. It takes a lot of strength. You might have to brace your foot against the body. Having that spine shape on there makes it so that the, the flesh of the person you just stabbed doesn't create as strong a vacuum. It's easier to get it out. It helps the blade to shed blood, and it also makes the blade much more sturdy and strong because it's got that thin spine, but the entire sword doesn't have to be thick. So you save on the weight with the edges, but that thick spine keeps it together. So that's a, a good feature, but not necessary. We see plenty of swords like these shorter stabbing swords where it's not as necessary to be able to break a vacuum seal, where you don't need as much strength because it's shorter shorter swords don't bend as badly along the flat axis. So not all swords, but a lot of swords have the central spine feature, and it's something you're going to see repeated in sword design moving ahead because it is a good practical feature and one that they've figured out real well by the Bronze Age. So here are a few examples of what these swords look like, including the ridiculously long one from Mycenae that I was talking about earlier. So there it is. There's something else about these swords that I need to bring up here, and that's they show very obvious signs of being imported from abroad. Even when we see local materials being used, there seem to be local workshops popping up imitating Egyptian and Mesopotamian and Hittite art. We see this across this region. Again, this is a region that is intimately connected by these networks of various kings, um, mostly kings. There are a couple queens, but it, it's pretty much a sausage fest in the, the Bronze Age. And they're all exchanging gifts as a way of socially networking and creating these ever-shifting alliances. And we see evidence of this in the burials of elites in Mycenae and across the Greek-speaking world in the Bronze Age. So at the top of this sword, and this is a, a reproduction of the actual sword found here, we see a pommel stone that's made out of Egyptian alabaster. We see a lot of gemstones that you can only get in Upper Egypt. So this is Egypt to the far south where the waterfalls of the Nile create a border between Egypt and uh, ancient Ethiopia. We also find work that seems to have been made in Egyptian workshops. This is one of them. So this is a dagger that was found at Mycenae. Again, we've got silver and gold inlay, but the scene is very Nilotic, down to the hunting cat. So you've got a tabby who's taking down some birds. This is papyrus reeds, some waterfowl. Look, guys, there isn't papyrus growing in the river valleys of the plains of Argos, and they don't seem to have a lot of hunting cats. Um, Cypress, kitties, definitely kitties. Not so many kitties in Mycenae. But this is something that when you're wearing it in front of your people shows, hey, I'm not just a local bigwig. I have connections. I'm friends with the king of Egypt, guys. The pharaoh likes me. He writes me letters. He knows me. I'm going to send him my daughter next week. And that's like literally part of how this works is that people, uh, Egypt is the the superpower on the block here. So one of the things you do when you're in power is you send a daughter to the pharaoh of Egypt, and then he puts that in his woman collection, and there we are. Uh, another thing that happens a lot in the Bronze Age is women are being trafficked for labor in fiber industries. 
as enslaved people working on wool and linen manufacture. So like that's going on. Which is all to say we tend to be like, oh, the glory of the Bronze Age, it was so wonderful. Guys, how are we defining glory? Because it's a little messed up if we consider a civilization effective when they're doing a swift business in human trafficking and also when they're supporting a society where wealthy people get all the special stuff and people who are less wealthy are dependent on these uh, fancy people and their guarded grain stores. Not saying it's all bad either. I don't mean to be like judgy at the Mycenaeans, but I think it's important to check ourselves because we're raised on the rhetorical opposite of that. Uh, we're raised to accept uh, just on its face that being a big civilization with a large geographical reach is how you know that a civilization has arrived. Like that's peak civilization. This is an idea that goes all the way back to the Bronze Age and the city-states of Mesopotamia. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. I think the Proto-Indo-Europeans would have a few things to say about city-states and imperialism being the only way to be successful and influential. All right, all right. So we're back to these daggers. There's yet another example of a fancy dagger with uh, Egyptian work and gold on the hilt. Yeah, really spiffy, nice looking. There are also these double-headed axes, which tend to show up a lot in Bronze Age Greek context. We think that has some ritual meaning. We see a lot of like fancy style as giant double-headed axes used as messaging. So we think that was a bit of a logo for this period. Now, as I was saying, in later Mycenaean swords, we do get much shorter blade shapes with uh, fewer central spines, but not, not always no central spines. Sometimes there'll be these grooves around the edges like you've got here. And these are likely used for stabbing for close quarter combat. There is this fresco from Pylos that's often used as evidence for the use of these short swords. However, let me point out to you. So these are the original bits. Now, if you were just seeing those bits, would you assume that there's a knife fight going on? Because maybe they're hugging, maybe they're dancing, maybe they're wrestling. Yeah, so no, the, the, this isn't evidence of Mycenaean dagger usage. But probably they are using a lot of these short swords because we find a lot of short swords. Okay. All right, guys. That's all I've got to say about that. So join us for three out of three, which I promise will be shorter, I'm so sorry, about the, his, the site of historical Troy and the, the evidence for an actual Trojan War. All right, later taters. Have a good one. Bye.